system, however. The, uh, the city gates originally looked pretty much like this. The tower, but there was a moat. It wasn't full of water, it was dry, but there was a deep ditch on the outside with a bridge across, and this enclosure on the bridge so that you know, enemies, if an enemy is approaching, get them inside there and close the gate and it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Again, the, the parapets, defensive parapets because there will be a walkway behind here. It took many, many years to complete. Uh, the second major project, a headquarters for the new government, a town hall for the city of Florence, located on the opposite side of the old city from the cathedral. You might think that that's why they put it there, to be a way to be separated from the uh, ecclesiastical headquarters. That may have been a consideration, but the 14th century author of a history of Florence who was on the scene when this happened tells us something different. They intentionally chose the site of one of these aristocratic family compounds, the houses of the Uberti, who were notorious traitors to the city of Florence. Dante puts Farinata degli Uberti in hell. They built the new Republican headquarters on this site to obliterate the memory of the Uberti. The building is now known as the Old Palace, Palazzo Vecchio, because the Duke of Florence built a new palace across the river. Its correct title is the Pal Palace of the Priors. This new government that was set up of the of guild members, the chief magistra magistracy, the highest level of government, was a committee of six called priors, one representing each sesto, each sixth of the city. During their two month terms, they were required to live in the palace and be isolated from the populace so that they couldn't be unduly influenced. So this was a residence. It also had a large hall for the two councils of citizens, the council of 200, and I think there was a council of 300, I'm not sure. Um, this too has undergone some changes. It, this is the main entrance now behind the copy of the Statue of David. You know, why is it way off to the side? And the, this facade also looks oddly random, <laughs> not symmetrical. That's because it isn't the original facade. The original facade was on the north side, facing the city, where you can see that it was quite symmetrical. You'd enter into this large room where government officials would collect taxes and so forth. Behind it, a large courtyard, very, uh, a very um, extravagant use of urban space. You might wonder why the building isn't square, isn't rectangular. <laughs> uh, the backside is slanted. We don't really know, but possibly because uh, it followed the line of the street that was already there. Florentines were very persnickety about abiding by the building line. I mean, they would literally stretch out ropes <laughs> to determine the, you know, the straight edge of the street. This is, an, oh, and here's the, um, uh, the courtyard, the decoration is all of the 15th century. And here is that large main room that you first enter. It's called the Sala delle Arme because they kept weapons here. Uh, vaulted, but notice that the vaulting, that the vaults are not pointed, they're not gothic, they're hemispherical arches. Apparently, uh, 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 pointed arches were associated with 
ecclesiastical architecture, and this is civic architecture. But the exterior of the building is just extraordinary. It's entirely sheathed in this rock-faced masonry, which means that the stones aren't finished to a flat surface. That would be ashlar. Every stone is different. Some project quite dramatically from the surface. Uh, every course is a different height. It's meant almost to look like a natural formation. You know, the imagery is the imagery of a fortress, of the strength of these big stones. But, you know, to make things look natural was obviously very labor intensive. The stones are shaped, but they're shaped to look like they're not shaped. So the imagery of fortification, and then in contrast, these delicate windows uh, they're called P4 windows, it just means two openings, two lights, divided by a slender colonnette. And these are the coats of arms of uh, the commune and the people. By the way, Florentines liked a particular kind of Gothic arch. It has two centers. So instead of being generated from one center, the inner arch generated from one center, and the outer arch is generated by two more. It's, it's a complex construction. Rising above the uh, building is a, a kind of watchtower. Again, the imagery is of fortification. It has galleries, cantilevered out from the side of the building that come from defensive architecture, from fortress architecture. So this is the fortress of the Republic, same up here. Now, notice how the tower comes right out to the plane of these galleries. In other words, it seems to be uh, supported by nothing. You know, it's over these projecting uh, balconies, although it's kind of an optical um, illusion. Um, here's a, a section that shows how it's um, supported. But it makes the construction of the tower look like something, I mean, it is something remarkable. <coughs> and then the most original element of all is this canopy on top of the watchtower, which ho houses the bells of the city. Almost, as, almost looking like a, um, the canopy over a Christian altar, identifying this as sacred space. It's almost a sacralization of this civic tower. Now, of course, many churches in Florence had their own bell towers to sound, you know, to tell people when to come to church, to sound the hours of the day. So this is, but this is the city's way of superseding all those other bell towers. You know, from now on, the hours of the day will be told by the civic bells, not by the church bells, which will also summon people to the palace uh, in times of emergency. Again, we have no idea who designed this building, as extraordinary as it is. The 16th century writer Vasari claimed it was Arnolfo di Cambio. I think he was making it up. We just, uh, strangely enough, as important as this building is, there's not a shred of documentary information about who designed this. Now, the piazza is surrounded on the, the palace which has expanded over the centuries um, to the east. The palace fronts on two sides on what is known as the Piazza dei Priori or della Signoria. Uh, the largest, one of the largest open spaces in the downtown area. Uh, originally just a small open space in front of the main facade 
expanded in stages over the 14th century. The government actually, you know, forced people to sell their property, their houses, and then demolished them for the expansion of the piazza until it reached the street which leads from the palace straight to the cathedral. And the last element of the piazza was this grand stage for the performance of civic ceremonies. The priors would be sworn in in public here, for example. It's a kind of open porch known as a loggia. You can see the scale of it. Here it is. And when the loggia was built, they finally moved to the main entrance from the north side over here. Here it is, a great ceremonial space that magnifies whatever human activities are taking place here. By the way, it's ornamented with depictions of seven virtues. You know what they are? Faith, hope, and charity, justice, temperance, prudence, and courage. And uh, what are these Christian symbols doing on a civic building? These are the virtues that by the 14th century were associated with good government. Are you going to Siena? When you see the frescoes of good government in Siena, you will see the virtues personified as the companions of good government. Now, the rest of the piazza, on this side there's a 19th century neo-Gothic palace. The rest of the piazza looks kind of motley these days. But in the 14th century, the government was very concerned about the appearance of the piazza. If you look closely, some parts have been thoroughly remodeled. But if you look closely, you can see the identical lower stories of buildings fronting on the piazza. The government mandated that owners of property on the piazza rebuild their facades according to a design very similar to the Palazzo Vecchio. And this is one survivor, and you know, it's a restaurant now. It's the same Sesto Acuto arches and um, rock-faced facade. They even wanted to have this uniform facade turn the corner onto that main street. This is the street that connects Piazza Signoria with the um, um, cathedral. And you can still see these 14th century facades all following the same design in the service of architectural unity and uniformity so that no one family could call attention to itself with a unique facade. You know, it lasted until the 16th century when the, there's a 16th century palace here when the Ubujoni were allowed to push their facade into the space of the piazza. But the whole idea is that we're all equal. <laughs> you know, nobody stands out from the rest. Now, these are the houses of wealthy people couldn't afford to remodel your property in, in uh, accord with the new designs, you had to sell it, basically. What about most Florentines, the 99%? What about the thousands of workers in the wool industry, for example? As it turns out, there's a fair amount of evidence about how they lived. They lived in houses like this. Houses about 14 or maybe 16 feet wide, two or possibly three stories, often incorporating a shop front because people, uh, you know, craftsmen sold from their homes. So the shop would be on the ground floor and they live upstairs. Uh, modest houses built of brick and stucco. Um, and if you get off the beaten track in Florence, 
away from the tourist areas, you will see the descendants of these houses. The lot lines of the 14th century are still there. The houses were uh, raised, often raised in the 18th century to four or five stories. But this could well be, this is the bones of a 14th century working class house. Now, the other interesting thing is that these houses are concentrated in specific areas. They're not scattered throughout the city. And these are the areas that are characterized by these narrow lots and whole streets of modest housing. Again, the law of the persistence of the plan. Notice one thing. They are outside the 12th century walls. They're in the area incorporated by the new walls. Uh, this was a big part of my dissertation, by the way, which is on Florentine urban development in the late Middle Ages. How did it happen that, these, that there are whole neighborhoods and streets of little houses? It was the result of the deliberate policy of the landowners. Who were these landowners? They were churches, monasteries, abbeys, in some cases, parish churches, who owned, like, this section was owned by uh, a monastery that was located further out in the countryside. In face of the demand for new housing, they took their vineyards and divided them up into building lots. Then they didn't sell them because the church is, was not allowed to sell property, ever. They divided, the, they created the new streets, they laid them out to their property, they divided them into building lots, and then they leased them on a long-term lease, usually about 30 years, to someone who was then obliged to build a house. So instead of buying your lot, you'd pay rent on it. It's called ground rent. You'd build, and you'd build a house. And you'd keep paying ground rent forever. It's a very nice investment for a monastery. <laughs> they get the rent over centuries. Plus, because they're the landlord, they can exercise social control over the population. I won't go into details, but it's very clear that this is a way of controlling those rowdy wool workers, for example, who had a tendency to um, riot at times. Uh, this area was developed by the canons of the cathedral. So, you know, wander a little bit and you'll discover yourself in these authentically medieval neighborhoods. I've already talked for an hour and a half. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, question here. What? There's a question here. Yeah. So I just want to say, like, 15 feet wide on a long, narrow lot, two stories, that's the same size as the Philly Row House. That's right. And by the way, Good point. By the way, Philadelphia was, I think, unique among American cities in perpetuating the practice of ground leasing well into the 19th century. Big landowners divided their estates into lots and then they leased them for a perpetual ground rent. There, there are lots of implications to this practice. It was done in England also but it came from the church, because churches couldn't sell property. Uh, the big advantage of ground leasing is that uh, relative, that working class people can afford to get a lot and build a house, because they don't have to lay out cash to buy the land. It means that all kinds of house carpenters and small-scale builders. This is what happened in Florence. 
the neighborhood I studied the most, a lot of the lots were rented to carpenters. They would build a house, and then they'd sell it to make their profit and transfer the ground lease to the new owner. Same thing happened in Philadelphia. Lots of small-scale artisans became developers, in a sense, because they could get the land without paying a lot of money for it, just invest you know, some capital in the construction of a modest house. OK, I, I, let me just say a little bit about the cathedral, because I'm sure you'll know more about it next week. The third major project, the walls, the palace, a new cathedral. By the end of the 13th century, the new government decided that their old Romanesque cathedral was way too dinky for a town of the size and importance of Florence. So the new cathedral was begun in 1296. Once again, facade entirely of the 19th century. I avert my eyes when I go past it. <laughs> Look at the increase in scale. Here's the old early Christian church, slightly remodeled in the 11th century. Here's the new church, about three times the size, four times the size. And you know, the first thing they had to do was knock down all the private houses standing in its way. Here we know the design of the first architect. His name was Arnolfo di Cambio, primarily known as a sculptor. Arnolfo started to build the church from the facade and wrapped it around the standing church because you can't be without a cathedral. It's the headquarters of the bishop. So the new church grows around the old one. He also started work on the facade this is what it looked like, which they never finished. This is what it looked like until the 16th century. I, th I don't know if this museum is going to be open, but you can see many of the sculptures that uh, Arnolfo and even Donatello executed for this facade in the, in the Cathedral Museum, like this the sculpture of the Virgin. Here's Santa Reparata. And here's another patron say the first bishop of Florence, St. Zenobius. So once again, the cathedral went through uh, a number of stages. We think that this is the size of Arnolfo's design. After the Black Death, when ironically there was a lot more money, so many people died that a lot of people got rich, <laughs> including the city. In the, four, the 1360s, they decided to expand it even more. So this is the final design. It is an extraordinary synthesis of two different building types. It's a traditional basilica and this amazing triconch plan of the east end, sort of three quarters of a centralized structure under uh, this uh, symmetrical around this dome. Nobody knows where this idea came from. It's completely original. And whether Arnolfo actually thought of it, or whether he designed a more traditional church is a matter of great controversy in scholarly circles. We do know the name of the designer of the final plan, Francesco Talendi, who doesn't get enough credit. So here's the inside. The two big churches in Florence at this time are Santa Maria Novella and Santa Croce. The cathedral follows Santa Maria Novella. It's vaulted, but again, with those broad, spacious bays, and very little in the way of dematerialization of the walls. Only a two-story elevation, with this tiny little clear story of under the um, uh, vaults. The 
Construction proceeded by fits and starts. For one thing, Arnolfo died within 10 years of starting the building. You know, there were wars, they had to build the walls, yada yada. By 1418, the construction had reached this point. The, the drum of the octagonal cupola. It's not a dome. The big question was, Here's the level of confidence, if not arrogance, of Florentines. By the 1360s, they had planned this huge structure, 138 feet clear span. Now, by comparison, the Pantheon is 148 feet, 144 feet. Nobody had built anything like this since antiquity. This design was, um, the architects had to f swear to follow this design. It was in effect a legal document. Here's the problem. In 1418, after 100 years, more than 100 years of construction on the cathedral, nobody knew how to build it. They didn't have a clue. They just thought, this is Florentine uh, confidence. They thought they would figure it out when the time came. Fortunately, someone did. Enter Filippo Brunelleschi, who solved the problem. And I'm leaving that for, my, uh, for whoever comes next to talk about Renaissance Florence, because it's quite an adventure story. But the idea was born by the middle of the 14th century. So, thank you for your uh, indulgence. And you have had such a good time. Gelato. Gelato.